So welcome to the second tutorial on crowds in Houdini 14. Uh, we're going to go a little bit beyond the basics here and just look at some of the more advanced features. And I'm going to go through diff various different uh, scene files that are already prepared and which you will be able to download from the usual place. So we've got a pretty standard setup here. If, you're, if you saw the first tutorial, this will be all very familiar. The only difference here is that we've used in the crowdsource node, we're scattering the points and we're using three different crowdsource nodes, each of which has a different color set. So this one's blue, this one is yellow, and this one is red. They're otherwise identical and they all start in the walk state. So let's have a look now at the very basic uh, simulation where we've just got a pop steer wonder applied to these agents. And uh, let's press play. And we can see that they, they sort of wander off in more or less the same direction, like so. Uh, let me switch on real time there. So, so far so good. What happens if we wanted to introduce a little bit more variety into the way our agents behave? Well, there are several ways we can do this. Uh, the first one uh, that I'm going to look at is, in fact, to use a drag force. Now, this is a normal pop node here. This isn't a special crowd node. Uh, and it, what it does is it slows down. It drags on the speed of the objects it applies to. Now, you may say, well, uh, why aren't we using these provisions here in the crowdsource node where we can set a minimum and maximum speed. Surely if we reduce the maximum speed that would slow down these particular group of this particular group of agents. Well unfortunately this this doesn't really work at the moment in Houdini 14. Uh, the animation uh, retiming uh, nodes inside the crowd solver actually adjust the maximum speed back to around two so that that doesn't work. So we've got to find something else and uh, one technique that works well is a pop drag force. You need to have a certain amount of air resistance here. I've got I've got five, uh, and here I'm also only applying it to the red agents. So uh, that deserves a little bit of explanation. When we set up our crowdsource nodes here, these three, and give them the names: blue agent, yellow agent, red agent. Uh, these names become groups here in the pop simulation. So. If I uh, have a look here, you probably can't see this is going to be off the recording, uh, but amongst the things listed here is blue agents, red agents, and yellow agents. So these are just groups, and we can, within a single uh, state of behavior, so this is all just within the walk state, uh, within the walk state we can apply different behaviors to different groups. So in this case, we're going to apply a drag to the red agents, and we're going to leave the rest of them with a standard pop steer wonder. So what happens when we press play? Well, uh, what should happen, let's zoom out, is that over time uh, we can see, broadly speaking, the red agents are getting left behind and everybody else is moving faster. So that's one way to vary the, the, the scene. Let's have a look at another one. Um, this is fairly simple. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you can select uh, to apply your, your pop steer nodes to different groups. So in this case we're simply applying one pop steer node to the red agents and a different pop steer node to the blue and yellow agents. And what I've done is I've given a different force to each of these. Uh, and this means that uh, when we press play, um, the red agent's going to head off in a different direction to the yellow and blue agents. And we can sort of see that more or less happening. The, the red agents are also traveling much more slowly. So those are some basic ways to offer variation. Uh, the final way is to use VEX. And this is more complicated and more advanced but also much more powerful. 
and in fact almost all of the pop steer nodes allow you to use VEX to vary the parameters and let me show you how to do that now. So I've got set up here a node where we're using VEX so let me switch to that so and have a look at the node so uh, let me enlarge this you've got here uh, these two um, toggles that allow you to use VEX expressions this this one uh, covers the parameters up here and this one covers the parameters down here and by default in fact this one is ticked and this is the, the, the default setup that you get with the standard node but let me have a look up here at what I've done with this uh, set of parameters up here. So the, the parameter I'm affecting here is the force, and this is the sort of basic direction uh, that your agents are going to travel in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a bit of VEX to rotate that randomly according to the agent. Now, the way to do this in VEX is using a matrix. So I set up a matrix, matrix M equals 1. That's just going to be what's called the identity matrix. It's a matrix that does nothing. Uh, then I'm using a VEX rotate. And what this does is it changes the matrix to produce a rotation. And this is the complicated and important part of the rotation. Uh, and then finally, there's an axis around which it is rotating. The Agents have on them uh, a number of attributes, and one of them is an up vector. Uh, that is to say, something that's pointing directly up. Uh, in this case, it's going to be pointing directly up in the y direction, and that's the axis we want to use for our rotation. So we can use v at sign up to retrieve that up vector. The v tells vex that it's a vector, the at tells you that you're retrieving an attribute, and up is the name of the attribute. So that's just going to be uh, the vector in the y direction. The rand is a thing that produces a random number between 0 and 1. The at id is just going to produce an id number for the each agent. So this will change per agent. So each agent has a different id. I'm just adding a thousand. You don't have to do that. And then the fit zero one is changing that, that range, which is between 0 and 1, into something more useful. And here I'm using minus 3.14 to 3.14, which is minus pi to plus pi. The rotations are, of course, in radians. And that is going to allow you to rotate your vector 180 degrees in one direction and 180 degrees in the other. So it's going to basically randomize it completely. And then if we multiply the force by that matrix, that's going to achieve uh, that variation. It's going to rotate the force direction around the axis randomly. Notice, by the way, that this force here doesn't have an at sign in front of it. Uh, and that's because the force is not an attribute on our agents. It's a parameter of our node. So in this case, we don't put the at sign. We just say force times equals the matrix. So the impact of this should be that each of our agents is going to head off in more or less a different direction. So broadly speaking, they're all going in different directions. So now we know about this use of VEX, we can have a look at the standard bit of VEX that's down the bottom here and work out what it's doing. And we can see it's affecting swirl size, pulse length, and offset. Let me enlarge this. And in each case, it's changing things according to the ID. So it's applying a different value for each single agent. So the Randall ID times 10 is going to produce, or 10.1 rather, is going to produce a random number between 0 and 1, then we multiply it by 15, and then we multiply the swirl size by that. So it's it's going to randomize the swirl size for every agent. The pulse length times equals to 10 just means that the pulse length is going to be 10 times bigger than whatever we set here. 
and the offset, which is the offset for the noise that's driving our randomness, uh, that is being offset by 10 times the ID number of the particle. That basically means that the noise is going to be different for every single particle, every single agent, and that means you're going to get that nice random motion. So let's look at another setup now, uh, which is looking at obstacle avoidance. So we've got uh, these robots, the same agents that we had before, and we've got this wall, which is an obstacle, and this is a goal. So let's have a look at our simulation and have a look through it. Uh, so we've just got a walk state, we've got a wander node, we've got the obstacle, which is pointed to that wall, and we've got a pop steer seek, which is pointing to the box goal. And that's as simple as it is. There's nothing else uh, here. It's all in that, uh, that chain of nodes. So let's have a look and see what it does. So when we press play, uh, we find that it's a pretty poor way of running such a simulation because the robots all get stuck, uh, bump into each other, and this robot here just gets stuck forever in the corner because it's trying to get attracted to this box uh, and thinks that the shortest route is through the wall. So it's not an intelligent uh, obstacle avoidance system, just very naive. It just tries to get um, through any obstacle by having a look and seeing where the gaps are. So it doesn't work very well in this case. Uh, what can we do about that? Well, I've done a number of things with this uh, simulation to get it to work better. Probably too many steps, but uh, let's have a look. Uh, so the, the other version of this is the two-stage. So let me go into our crowdsource node and, and explain some things here. So we have two varieties of, of the crowdsource. Uh, I will come on to this one later. This is the one we're using for the moment. And I've got two outputs here, which are the two different simulations. So if I just switch this through, this is going to use the two-stage simulation. And then if we have a look at that stage, that two-stage simulation, we can see it's a little bit more complicated. So we're starting off in the walk state. We've got the pop steer wander, we've got the pop steer article, obstacle, and we've got the pop steer path. Now, a pop steer path node simply attracts the agent to a path, in other words, a curve, and then drives it along that curve from beginning to end. Uh, and by the way, if you find your agents are going in the wrong direction, you can just tick this box to get them to go in the other direction. And let me just have a look and show you this. Uh, uh, this, by the way, there's some fault with the current version of, of Fujini that I'm using these these this array of dots shouldn't really be there. But hopefully, let's go up one level, we can see this better. Hopefully you can see that there's the path here. This is this is the path. So it's very simple. It's just a straight line going towards the, the hole. So initially, these uh, robots are not going to get attracted to the box. They're just going to get attracted to this line and then be propelled along it. So we need a second stage. And I have a box here, which by default I've got turned off. And what this is going to do is act as a bounding box. And when the agents get into this bounding box, their state will change. And instead of following the path, they'll be attracted by this uh, target here. And that's fine, because by the time they get into here, they're through the wall, they're not going to get trapped. So I'll switch that uh, box back off again for the moment. And let's go back and have a look at our simulation. So, uh, I mentioned these nodes already, so we've got the, the wander, the obstacle, and then the path, which is going to take it through this gap. And then it's going to move onto a state called seek goal. And this is going to be determined by when the agents go into the box. And all it does is it seeks the box goal, and we have a bit of randomness for the pop steer wander as well. Let's have a look now at the transitions, and you'll see there are two. Let's ignore this one for the moment. We're going to come on to that later, and let's have a look at this one. 
So this is past wall, I've called it. And all it's doing is it's looking at this sub object, i.e. the box, and having a look at when uh, the agents come into that box and then triggering the change. And the change is to move from walk to seek goal. So in the walk state, they're following the path. They get into here, they start going towards uh, the goal. Let me just press play and hopefully this will show us. They still get, uh, they get stuck. It's not terribly good. They're getting stuck, but they are eventually, I think, all going to get through. It's going to take a while. Maybe this one is going to take a long while. He's working his way across there very slowly. But eventually they all get through and they all head off over here, which is the result we want. But it's not very elegant. So there's another thing we can do, which is going to use a bespoke transition. Let me first have a look, however, at the data that we need to set up for this bespoke transition to work. And that data is set up here in the crowdsource node. So if we have a look at this, this second leg of the crowdsource node is needs to be set to 1. The switch needs to be set to 1 so that we're selecting these nodes. This is the same crowdsource as we have before, uh, except that the agents start in a... where is it? In the stand state rather than the walk state and that's just going to then it's their stationary and then we sort them by z and that means that we're going to order them according to how far away they are from this point in effect because it's along the z-axis the z-axis is is this axis along here and we can see if we click show points we can say this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's according to how far they weigh. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep them in the stand state and release them in order. So this one will go first, that one will go second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. So that we avoid the, the situation where there's a conflict at the door and they're both trying to get through at the same time. And in order to do that, we need to give each of them a sort of time at which they will uh, start moving. And we can do that here by this attribute create. And I have a creating the attribute called start time and the value I'm giving is dollar pt over the frames per second times 10. Now dollar pt is the point number so 0 1 2 3 and so on as we just saw. The frames per second is the is the number of um, uh, frames in each second so probably in this case I think we're on 25 frames per second. So that by default is going to start each one at 0.25, sorry, one over 25, so whatever that is, seconds after one after the other. And then we multiply it by 10, so they're spaced out a little bit more than that, because this value has to be a time, not a frame number. That's why we're sort of converting by dividing by the number of frames per second. Now let us have a look at how that's used in the simulation itself which is over here. And one of the things you can do with the crowd, crowd trigger node is to set it to custom vex expression. And we need a name as before, so we give it a unique name. And then we've got this vex expression here. And let me enlarge this so we can see it. So uh, the, the attribute you need to set uh, for the trigger is called trigger, and it's an integer. And if it's set to 1, uh, then the trigger will be fired, if you like, and the transition will happen. Uh, if it's set to 0, it won't. And all we need to do is compare the state duration, which is an attribute that we've used before. That tells you how long uh, the agent has been in this particular state. In other words, the stand state. In other words, how long since the start of the simulation. Uh, and then the start time, which is that attribute that we put on the points in the crowd source node and that's been copied across here to the agents in the simulation and it's just an attribute it's a floating point value and so we can just say if one is greater than the other then fire the trigger uh, as you know in in vex as in c uh, this operator the greater than operator produces a result of either one if it's true or zero if it's false 
So we can just set the I trigger value directly to the results of the second part of this expression. So good. And then of course uh, what we do is take the transition and move from standing to walking. We've got a fairly short uh, time of transition and then we randomly change it a little bit. Let me turn the, the point, let me turn off the display of points as well. Ah, well, there you are. That's how I can get rid of that. But let's have a look now at what happens with all of these things enabled. So we can see the first one goes, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, and then the last one. So, and he looks around for a little bit, but then he goes. So uh, that shows you how to elegantly get all of these agents through the wall. So in this next example, uh, we're going to look at a a complex set of movements. So the robots are going to get attracted over to this box over here and once uh, they reach a certain distance to it they will turn towards this null here and to bow which is a new piece of animation we've added and then move off. So let's demonstrate that. So let's press play. So they're all moving towards uh, the box and then at a certain point this lead one probably right is turning towards the null bowing bowing and then moving away from the box and heading off so let's have a look and see how we did this and there's nothing very special in the crowdsource node this is a, just a very standard set up for the crowdsource. Everybody starts in the uh, in the um, walk state. And we've got just two boxes here. This is the target that they're going to move towards and this is the null that they're going to bow towards. So everything is really happening inside here. So let's have a look at the the first set of nodes here. So very similar to what we've had before. Uh, it's a pop steer wanted to give a bit of randomness to the movement and a pop steer seek which is using that uh, box as a target. And then we've got the bow behavior, and all that it's doing is using the bow clip to uh, get a bow. We've got the in-place gate speed set to zero because the, the robot isn't actually going to be moving, it's just going to be bowing. Um, we give it a blue color so that we know it's in the bow state. And then this is the key uh, one of the key nodes, which is to set the heading, and we'll come on to that in a minute. And then the pop wrangle stand allows you to uh, just to close off the velocity and the force so that it doesn't move. And then finally, uh, once uh, it's finished bowing, uh, it walks away. And the walk away node just uses the walk clip and the pop steer wonder as before, but the pop steer seek is again using the bow trigger but in the force, we've got a negative force. And that means that instead of moving towards our trigger, which is that box, uh, it'll move away, which is why they're turning around and moving off. So there are two uh, complicated things about this, one of which is the trigger to move into the bow state, which we'll come on to, and the other is this node which sets the heading. So let's have a look at the trigger first. And this is really quite simple. Uh, it takes an object distance from a SOP object and the SOP object is that the box which they're moving towards and we compare it to a distance of three units and if this agent is nearer than three units to the box the transition is triggered and it moves from the walk state to the bow state. All well and good. And then here, just for completeness, uh, after the bow state has been in progress for four seconds, then we move to the walk away state. And four seconds, in fact, I happen to know because I've set it up right, allows for two bows uh, and then it walks away. So let's have a look at this set heading node. And this is a pop wrangle. So this is just an arbitrary bit of VEX code. And let me, in fact, have a look at this in the enlarged screen. So where are we? Pop set heading. 
Okay, so first of all, we've set up an extra parameter here. We've gone to this node, we've said edit parameter interface, and we've added a float vector 3, and we've called it uh, somewhere down here location. So it's a three valued float. And then uh, this is just a channel reference. So we've uh, this is the null tx, ty, tz, and I've got that by at the scene level here, going to that null, copying that parameter, and then here just paste copied references. And that's how we've got these cross references which give you the position of the null. So we know the position of the null, and we know the position of the agent, which is just P. So how do we get the heading? Uh, well, um, we take the CHP, that's going to produce a three point, a three float number from a channel, in this case the location. So we're reading in this as, as a, a point, and then we need to convert it to a vector, make sure that Vex understand it's a vector, and take away the position at P, which is a standard attribute, gives you the position. And we're putting this in a attribute called heading, which is a standard attribute. And what that does, um, instead of uh, just immediately switching the heading to that new value, that will use some values we've set in here in the crowdsource node, uh, where we here, and there's a maximum turn rate. So that tells you how fast it's going to turn towards the place that it's going to be heading towards. So uh, we can see that they move towards, they enter. Let's just get back a few frames. So this one at the front has a light blue circle, so it's still in the walk state. Dark blue circle means it's in the in the uh, bow state, and it moves towards the point, turns its heading towards the point, and bows down, and bows back up, and it does that one more time, then it moves to a magenta state, which means it's now in the walk away state, and then it, it walks off. So that is how to achieve uh, some tricks with heading and with uh, transitions based on closest to an object. So that's a quick look at three additional files with some additional tricks for crowds in Houdini 14. Uh, I hope it's been useful. Thank you very much.